So here we are, in the shadow of the Erd Tree, possibly one of the greatest trailers I've ever watched, and From Software have clearly pulled out all the stops with this DLC. New armor, weapons, story, locations, enemies, and bosses. And of course, the lore tidbits were enough to send all of us into a frenzy, with massive implications for potential storylines. Even in this 3 minute trailer, there is plenty to discuss from a lore perspective, and so I present to you my trailer breakdown. I won't be doing a frame by frame analysis, rather I want to give you my thoughts on the lore elements of the trailer, speculate, and tie it back to the lore of the base game, which we have of course covered in great detail over the past 2 years on this channel. Ultimately, my aim in this video is to unpack the dialogue, hints and clues regarding the story of Shadow of the Earth Tree, and give you my take on what the broad strokes of the lore may be. We also have some details from the man himself, Miyazaki, via interviews with the likes of Famitsu and IGN, which helps clarify some of the more ambiguous elements of the trailer, and there are some really massive lore bombshells in these, so I will be referencing these where relevant. So join me this week as we dive into the lands of Shadow and we begin to speculate on the new upcoming lore. I think a good place to start is actually with the official text, the flavour text, from Bandai Namco's website about the DLC, and it reads the following. The Land of Shadow, a place obscured by the Erd Tree, where the goddess Marika first set foot, a land purged in an unsung battle, set ablaze by Mesmer's flame. It was to this land that Mikola departed, divesting himself of his flesh, his strength, his lineage, of all things golden, and now Mikola awaits the return of his promised lord. So many interesting lore implications here. The idea that this is the land where Marika first set foot, that it is a land obscured by the Erd Tree, and that Mikola has willingly come here by giving up his very flesh. I will refer back to this bit of text frequently, and henceforth I will just call it the flavour text, so you know what I'm talking about when I say flavour text. The idea that this is the land where Marika first set foot is huge. There are massive lore implications from a Famitsu article that imply that this is actually the land where it all began, where Marika became a god. These of course are some massive plot points, and we will return to Marika shortly, but for now I want to discuss the prospect of Mikola divesting his flesh and coming here on purpose. We do hear bits of this throughout the trailer as well in dialogues, but it's nice to get this overview from the flavour text. So this new region is called the Land of Shadow, clearly an alternate realm, one that has been devastated by the Erd Tree's arrival, disconnected from the lands between and living in the shadow of the Erd Tree instead of under its grace, like the lands between. All the information we have points to the fact that this is not a dream world like many guessed when that concept art was released a year ago. Indeed, this seems to be confirmed by Miyazaki himself, who says the following in an interview with IGN. First of all, the setting of Shadow of the Erd Tree is a brand new land. It's a brand new map separate from the lands between. It is a land that is overshadowed by the particular shadow of the Erd Tree as opposed to the Erd Tree in the lands between, and it takes place again on an entirely separate, physically separate map. So it will involve a warp gate of sorts to get there. In terms of setting and themes, it technically occupies the same space as the Lands Between, the same universe, but due to something story related that we won't reveal today, this has become physically disconnected, and you'll travel to the Shadow of the Erd Tree land as a separate place. So this land of Shadow itself is a place the player will visit to walk in the steps of Mikola. Mikola is a key part of the story this time, perhaps as guessed by many players who saw the art that was released previously. That is in fact Mikola, and it is he who travelled to the Land of Shadow, and it's the players who will be tracing his path and following in his footsteps trying to see what he is going to do there. Another axis of the story is Queen Marika, and what she did in the Land of Shadow, and what led Mikola to follow her there. Again this all makes sense to me given what we have seen in the trailer. It's a land that's more than just a dream or reflection, it used to be a physical place in the current realm, but it's been transposed by the arrival of the Erd Tree. It is a realm with its own history, culture, 
villains and heroes. Despite the fact that it's not a dream realm, one of the most striking things we notice about the landscape is the drapes up in the sky. These are of course drapes that are similar to ones you'd find in a bedchamber, like in Marika's bedchamber, or the Baldachin of Fia and the Deathbed Companions. There are a lot of different speculation avenues we can go down. Could this be a reference to the aforementioned Baldachin and thus those who live in death? The Shadow Realm seems like a place where things heretical to the Erd Tree exist, but we will return to that facet shortly. Sekiro Dubi put out an interesting theory on Twitter. The drapes are so similar in fact to Marika's bedchamber. Is it possible that this is an overlap between the two worlds for some reason? That these are literally the drapes of Marika's bedchamber showing in the sky? Present here because it is Marika's will that has separated the land of shadows from the lands between. The last scene of the trailer seems to show Mikola. Mikola in the form that we expect despite his body's deformities in the lands between. This again brings me back to the flavour text that we looked at at the beginning of the video, where it states that Mikla gave up his flesh to come here. This means that the physical self of him in the lands between is disconnected from this new manifestation of him that we can find in the lands of shadows. This means there is some spatial or temporal disconnect from the main world. If Mikla has given up his flesh, to come here and yet we see him restored in this realm, it reinforces what Miyazaki said about this place's relation to the real world or the lands between, that it is disconnected, and thus the effects on Mikola's body that happened in the lands between are not relevant here as he is manifested in a completely different realm. With all that said, it brings me back to another aspect of the trailer that a few of us have noticed, that there seem to be a few references to Sintrina. Many of us, including myself, have theorised that Centrina is an alternate ego or personality of Mikola. We see a character using what seems to be a Centrina spell, but more importantly Quelag made an important observation. There seems to be a character that is asleep among what looks like Centrina's lilies. Now given Centrina's association with sleep, I think this still is very much a reference to Centrina. I think Quelag's analysis is spot on here. Perhaps we will see the restoration of the deleted dream NPC St. Trina questline. Either way, the drapes in the sky could be reflective of St. Trina's relationship to sleep, though I think that is less likely. The opening portion of the trailer is about Mikla. The first shots we see in the trailer are of course of Mikla's cocoon found in Mogwin Palace. There is also an opening monologue from an unseen NPC that talks about Mikla's intentions. Pure and radiant. He wields love to shrive clean the hearts of men. There is nothing more terrifying. This seems to line up with how Mikla is perceived in the base game. He is pure and sincere in his intentions to make a better world, without the dogma of the Erdtree Order. Though clearly the NPC that is narrating this sees this type of radical ideal as dangerous or a threat, and again we don't really know why. We do see the lower half of an NPC in this scene. The robes don't seem to be an exact match for anything that's in the base game as far as I can tell, but they look similar to robes that are associated with aristocracy in the lands between. The ruler set, the consort and official sets for examples. This could mean a couple of things. I saw some people trying to relate it to Tanith, which does make sense given its similarities to the consort dress and the snake themes revolving around Mesmer. However, again, Quelag came up with a really great observation, and again, please check out Quelag's Twitter and channel, as she's really good at picking out these details in regards to symbology, etc. But Quelag made an observation and made a suggestion that perhaps Tanith and some of other Laindel's noble culture could have come from the Land of Shadow originally. Remember, this was a real physical place that wasn't initially disconnected. It was a region in this real world. And also remember that Tanith's lore contained within the Consort Mask tells us that she came from a foreign land. Could this be the foreign land from which she hails? Quelag does make some compelling observations in regards to the similarity between the masks of Marais and Tanith to the armour set shown in the trailer. It does seem as though there will be an NPC in Mikla's chamber, encouraging us to travel to the Realm of Shadow, as we later hear this dialogue. Come now. Touch the withered arm and travel to the realm of shadow. 
So this also confirms what we've all predicted since day one. The DLC will be accessible from Mikola's cocoon and hand. Meaning that we'll be likely using Mikola's physical connection to this place as a bridge of sort, a bridge between the two worlds. Miyazaki confirms that Mikla has come here for his own objectives, as he says the following in the IGN interview. The cocoon and arm you saw at the beginning of the trailer. This is actually the point of entry to the Land of Shadow, where the players will enter the DLC. And this does have some relation to Mikla. And Mikla, as we have said, travelled to the Land of Shadow. He does have some motive and objective there, which we won't give away too much but essentially the player will be following in those footsteps, in the same way that they followed the blessings from the Grace, the sights of Grace in the Lands Between. They'll be following in Mikla's footsteps, and these will guide them through the Land of Shadow, and reveal that motivation to them. Mikla chose to come here, and this brings me back to the state we find Mikla in, in the base game, in a cocoon. My speculation has always been that Mikla was the one who cocooned himself, this does seem likely, although it's not actually confirmed in-game, and that Moog merely cracked it open, stealing Mikla so that he could corrupt his form with his corrupted blood in a vain attempt to raise up a god of blood. In the opening slides to the base game, we see a slide of Moog stealing Mikla. Mikla is covered in a sticky substance, which I've always taken to be an amniotic type fluid from the cocoon that he was in. He has also got fly-like wings, reinforcing the idea that he formed this insect-like cocoon himself. It would also fit perfectly into the wall of the Halig tree, and given the Mikola-esque form that has appeared in the wall of the tree surrounding this hole, I believe it's almost a certainty that this is where Mikola's cocoon was embedded. There are of course other cocoons throughout the Halig tree, and now with the additional context of the trailer in hand, I suggest this is how Mikola transported his mind to this shadow realm, and perhaps the cocoon people around the Halig tree were his followers attempting to join him. Miyazaki alludes to Mikola's purpose here, but what could it actually be? Well, we do know a decent amount about Mikola's motivations from the base game. We know that he was interested in finding a cure for his sister's afflictions, thanks to the description of Radigan's Rings of Light, implying strongly that this was the reason he initially helped his father develop Golden Order Fundamentalism Miracles. He was plumbing its depths for a cure to his sister's affliction. The description of Mikola's unalloyed gold needle further emphasises Mikola's desire to rid the world of the meddling of the Outer Gods, like the Outer God of Rot who afflicted his sister. Additionally, Melania's armour set reads the following. My brother will keep his promise. He possesses the wisdom, the allure of a god. He is the most fearsome Empyrean of all. This is clearly a quote from Melania, and prior to the DLC I'd thought this was a vain hope of hers, a bit of copium, that she still believed her brother would deliver despite the fact he was more or less dead. However, it seems that Melania's faith in her brother is actually well founded, as Mikola is still active despite the mutilation of his terrestrial form. And perhaps Melania knows full well about his journey to the Shadowlands and his aim in doing so, and so actually the state of his physical form is not really a concern to her. Given Mikola's conviction in making a purer, unalloyed world, freed from the meddling of outer gods, could we not assume that his journey here is to achieve his vision of a better, purer world? The opening dialogue of the DLC trailer again seems to align with what we know of Mikola, that he wants to purify everything. Perhaps in unifying the Shadow Realm with the Erdtree Realm, or by purifying the Shadow Lands, Mikola will be fixing something that's broken, some corruption, when the Lands of Shadow were disconnected by the Erdtree. The end of the trailer does seem to show Mikola purifying or casting some magic on this twisted version of a tree, but I guess ultimately we will see what his aim is here. There are a couple of Mikola details I wanted to discuss before we move on. Firstly, there appears to be a great rune at one point. Given the association the DLC clearly has to Mikla, it is most likely his. Indeed, it does have a similar composition to his sister, and as we know from the description of Moog's great rune, familial ties can affect the shape of the runes. I've no real further points about this rune other than it would be interesting if the possession of this rune would have an effect on a new ending to the game, 
or even if it has a role to play in the story of the DLC. There's something else that is interesting in the initial text, the flavour text that we looked at before. It says that now Mikla awaits the return of his promised lord. What does this mean? I do think there will now be a Mikla ending, a unalloyed purified ending. An ending that will line up with his vision of a purified world, where we will become his lord in order to champion this. In many of my Elden Ring lore videos, I've talked about the composition of the ruling body of each new order. There is always a god, and there is always a lord. Placidusax was the lord in the age before the Erd Tree. He was the lord to another god. Godfrey was lord to Marika, as later was Radigan. There's always a lord and a god. For example, Moog wants to be the lord of blood, and wants Mikla to be his god. Does this mean that Mikla will become the new god? He is after all an Empyrean, and Empyreans are candidates for godhood. Will he become the new god of a new age, and we will become his lord? That would be an incredible ending, and I really hope we see that. So to try and understand Mikla's aim in being here, and the scope of the DLC, it's time to talk about the Land of Shadows a bit more. But my synopsis about them is this. Marika is the one who devastated these lands and its original culture. It is now disconnected from the main world because of the gestation of the Erd Tree, and ultimately it's now become a dumping ground for things that should live in the shadow of the Erd Tree, things heretical, and it's ruled over by Mesmer, another of her demigod children, but don't worry, we will unpack all that shortly. There's an interesting text from the Bandai Namco website, which reads the following. Guided by Mikla, players embark on a new adventure in the Land of Shadow, a world full of dark secrets hidden behind the prosperity of the Golden Order brought upon by Marika. The wording here very much suggests that Marika has used the Lands of Shadow for some reason, to make the World of Grace more prosperous somehow, to the detriment of these lands, of course. Furthermore, if we once again return to that initial Bandai Namco flavour text, it suggests that this Land of Shadow is where Marika herself first set foot. These lands were where it all began. Even more exhilarating is this incredible quote from Famitsu, from their interview with Miyazaki, which reads the following translated. In fact, the Land of Shadows is the place where Marika became a god, and the Golden Tree was born. Naturally, there was a culture that existed before the Golden Tree, and the Lion Dance character is derived from that culture. We'll come back to the Lion Dance character, but this is where Marika's story begins, and this is the land where the Erd Tree and the Golden Order was born. Massive! So no doubt the twisted tree we see in the skyline will have something to do with the Erd Tree's gestation. The flavour text also says that the Land of Shadows are lands that are obscured by the Erd Tree, again reinforcing the fact that Marika and the Erd Tree are responsible for its current state, its purpose, and why it's now disconnected physically from the lands between. There's also a relevant quote from the IGN interview with Miyazaki, where Miyazaki said the following, Another access to the story is Queen Marika and what she did in the Land of Shadow, and what led Mikla to follow her there. So Marika did something here. She did something to establish the Golden Order create the Erd Tree, all resulting in the current relationship and state of the world that we have now. We have the lands between on one side, and we have this land of shadow on the other side, that is disconnected, living in the shadow of the Erd Tree, obscured by it, removed from the real world by the Erd Tree. Something massive happened here. And Mikola has come here, likely, to undo Marika's actions. Melania has always been right about Mikola. He truly is the most fearsome Empyrean of all. But cycling once again back to that flavour text, we do get a little bit of the history of the Lands of Shadow. There is an unsung war that is mentioned. What is this war? Well thankfully Miyazaki again once again offers some interesting insights via the IGN interview, where he spoke of the metal fire wicker man enemy that you see in the game, and he said the following of this particular enemy. Okay, so this giant basket of flame, as you so eloquently put it, Mitchell, was a terrible weapon you used in a war, occurred in the Land of Shadow, basically. So again, without saying too much, 
We can't give away the name just yet officially, but yes, it was a really gruesome weapon that was used, and the kindling you see is actually the remains of bodies that were put in there to burn. Presumably Miyazaki can't release the name of this enemy because it has some story significance that we'll all immediately get. Perhaps it's a weapon that's fueled by the bodies of the Tarnish given that they can't truly die. Or perhaps it names the race and culture that used to live here and Miyazaki doesn't want to reveal that yet, given it's using the burned bodies of the fallen, perhaps it's the bodies of those that have been defeated and it would name that culture and he just doesn't want us to know that yet. This particular enemy then was used as a weapon in this war, a war so terrible that it is literally formed of hundreds of bodies that are being burned. An NPC from the trailer comments on the war, talking about the people who were on the losing side of it, as she says, They were never saints, they just happened to be on the losing side of a war. Was this war part of Marika's conquest that we learn about, and was actually the very first of them? Was there a society here that was once opposed to the rule of the Erdtree and Marika? We can only imagine what terrible act Marika must have done to form the Erdtree and leave the Land of Shadows in this state, so no wonder the people that lived here would have opposed her. Indeed, we previously looked at the quote from Famitsu, and it confirms that there was a culture here prior to the Erdtree, and all of this reinforces to me that this was the very first of Queen Marika's conquests and this land was completely devastated as she created the Erdtree. I am intrigued to know more, but knowing Marika's ruthless nature, I have no doubt that she is behind this war for whatever reason. We will discuss Mesmer next, and I will explain how I believe Mesmer was actually aligned with Queen Marika, despite his rather heretical appearance. I believe he is Marika's representative here, the chosen demigod who rules over this shadow domain on behalf of his mother to make sure whatever she has achieved here will not be undone or escape. With that said, let us unpack Mesmer. The main focus of my attention in this trailer was of course Mesmer the Impaler, so named by the collector's edition and helmet that's been sold. Clearly the antagonist and probably final boss to this new expansion. There's a lot to unpack here with his visual design alone, so let's just jump right in and start unpacking his lore. I want to start with some of his dialogue which is rather revealing, as he says, Mother, wouldst thou truly lordship sanction in one so bereft of light? Mesmer refers to his mother here, and questions why she would put a tarnished on the throne. To me this mother can be none other than Marka herself. Marka is of course relevant to this DLC, and Marka, as I've discussed in numerous lore videos, has had a hand in guiding the Tarnished to take the throne, and this therefore would make sense of this dialogue. We learn that it was her who placed Hugh in Round Table Hold, in order to assist the Tarnished in killing a god, the Elden Beast. Oh, your divinity have mercy and grant me forgiveness. The road is yet long, a god is not easily felled. But one day without fail you will have your wish. So please grant me forgiveness, Queen Marika. This of course means that she wanted the Tarnished to defeat the Elden Beast and set the throne. Gideon's interpretation of Marika not wanting us to succeed, in my opinion, is wrong. And in my opinion is the result of him being manipulated by Radigan, whose will he believed to be Marika's. But I discussed this more in my Radigan video so I would direct you there. As such, I think Mesmer questioning the validity of a Tarnished as Lord is a question posed to Marika. So that is his mother, he is another of her demigod children. We know there are other demigods that we haven't faced in game. The Bandai Namco article from pre-launch regarding the story trailer talks about the numerous demigods who were slaughtered in the Night of the Black Knives, not just Godwin, unnamed dead demigods. Then we also know from the Mausoleum Soldier Ashes item description that the Wandering Mausoleums contain unknown dead demigods, again other children of Marika that we just don't know the names of. So it shouldn't be too surprising that we are facing another child of Queen Marika, another demigod that wasn't present in the Lands Between because he has been here in the Land of Shadows. Looking at his physical form, we can see that he has red hair, 
suggesting he is of the line of Marika and Radigan, much like Mikola and Melania. Perhaps this is an unknown older sibling who left for the Land of Shadows before they were born. The user Amigop on Twitter DM'd me to share a theory with me, that perhaps the smouldering butterflies represent Mesmer, as the Aeonian ones represent Melania, and the nascent ones represent Mikola. This is a great idea that reinforces the symmetry behind the idea that Mesmer is of the Marika Radigan lineage. So yeah, massive shout out to user Amigop who not only shared this theory with me, but was kind enough to let me use their image that they created for this comparison. I'm very grateful. Additionally, the first letter of Mesmer's name fits with what we know in the game. Radigan's children with Ranala all begin with the letter R, as if after their mother. Rikard, Radan, and Rani. Whereas Radigan's children with Marika all begin with the letter M, as if after her. Mikola, Melania, and now Mesmer. There is also a really great observation made on Twitter by the user Dylan, who pointed out that the statue behind Mesmer, shown in the trailer, is most likely to be a statue of Marika. The braid matches, the signature swirling cloth is also present. The statue behind Mesmer is cradling a child, perhaps Mesmer himself. Again, massive shout out to Dylan, this is a great observation. In fact, as I was writing this section on the script, I read the IGN interview where it is outright confirmed by Miyazaki that Mesmer is indeed one of Marika's demigod children. He says the following. You may have seen at the end of the trailer, there was a piece of key art where it shows Mesmer sat in his throne-like chair, and people who have played the game may recognise this throne to be one of those from the boss room where you battle Morgoth. And this represents the thrones at the base of the Erd Tree, and it's supposed to symbolise that Mesmer stands on equal footing to these other demigods and children of Marka, who sat around in these thrones, and held the rooms of the Erd Tree. So he's an important figure who rivals these other demigods, and as you play the DLC, you will learn a little about why he wasn't featured in the Legends of the Erd Tree, The Lands Between. You'll realise why he existed in this shadow, this land of shadow. We will return to the other aspects of this quote shortly that deals with his position, but I want to home in on the fact that it says he is on equal footing to the other demigods and other children of Marika. And if this isn't clear enough for you, the Fumitsu article straight up names him Marika's child. With that said, and kind of established that this is another demigod and child of Marika, let's talk about the appearance of Mesmer as there's tons of detail here. First of all, he seems to be wielding the blood flame, and his spear, his impaling spear, very much looks like Moog's trident except with just one prong obviously. This makes us think that there's an association with the formless mother, a force somewhat heretical, to the Golden Order, and as we discuss Mesmer more, you will see that this really is a pattern with him. I mentioned Bloodflame and the Formless Mother, but could there also be a connection to the Blood Star? This is interesting because I am actually working on a Blood Star video that should be out in the next week or so. But returning to Mesmer, if we look at the cover art, the concept art, we see Mesmer sitting on his throne with his hand open, and there seems to be a blood flame in his hand, but from these flames seems to be thorns. This makes us think of the sorceries of the guilty and that associated with the Blood Star. The rest of his getup is also similarly heretical. He is of course covered and adorned in snakes. We know from the Dulis Selm that the snake is considered in Erdtree society to be heretical or in opposition to the Erdtree, and thus in these gladiatorial games, people used to enjoy the snakes on the helmet of these Dulis be beaten up. In past videos, I have ruminated on why the snake is so hated. It can't just be because of Rikard, as that is a recent event, and the gladiatorial games date back to Godfrey's era. So there must be something older in the history of the Erdtree and the People of Grace that makes them hate the snakes. Perhaps we will learn more now. Perhaps the snakes were some of the culture that lived in these lands of shadow. It will be interesting to uncover if there's any connection between him and Rikard and Mount Gelmir. As we've discussed, we already think these smouldering butterflies are ones that are possibly associated with Mesmer. And of course, one of the main locations you can find these smouldering butterflies is Mount Gelmir. Coupled with the association with snakes, I think there has to be something here in Mesmer's past that has something to do 
with Mount Gelmir, but all we can do is wait and find out. There is another important detail regarding Mesmer's appearance. It is difficult to see, but if you pause at the moment it zooms in on his face, it seems as though one of his eyes are sealed, his left eye. This follows the visual design of Melina and Rani. What is the relevance of such a ceiling? In Melina's case, it is heavily hinted that it is related to her possible past as the Glomide Queen, and the sealing of destined death. Will Mesmer have a hidden power that is sealed away as well? The frenzied flame? Something new? Only time will tell. Having looked at all this, what becomes clear is it just marks Mesmer out as someone who surrounds himself with the heretical. This brings me to what I see as one of the most interesting bits of symbology that I think tells us a lot about Mesmer's rule and the Land of Shadows as a whole. Miyazaki stated that while the lands between are basically lit up by the radiance of the Erd Tree, this realm is the opposite. This is a realm that lives in the shadow of the Erd Tree and is heterodox to the order of grace that exists. This brings me to the interesting sigil found on Mesmer's Impaler. It is two half circles inversions of one another, and to me it immediately means one thing. As above, so below. Again, whether this is literally an inverted shadow realm that exists underneath the real world, like an inverted shadow, or has some other kind of relationship or makeup, remains to be seen. But to me this symbol found on his impaler perfectly represents the idea that this is the shadow realm of the Erd Tree, or at least that's what it's become since the Erd Tree was gestated. This brings us to another interesting detail that is shown by the Collector's Edition of all things. On the image for the Mesmer Collector statue, and boy what a statue, we can see he wears a sigil on the back of his cloak, like most of the demigods who have their own house sigil. This same sigil is shown more clearly on the Collector's Edition box, and we can presume that this is Mesmer's house heraldry that represents his rule and ideals. The sigil shows some very interesting imagery, there are of course the snakes, enemies of the Erd Tree. There appears to be what is a flame, which could be the blood flame of the formless mother or the frenzied flame. Indeed, it does almost seem to be the same sigil as the frenzied flame, or is at least very similar. Though I also note it looks very similar to the dragon communion sigil, which you'll see here. This is also most interesting because Mesmer's armour that he's wearing is very similar in appearance to the Drake set. And the Drake Knight set is also related to Dragon Communion, as the armour set reads the following. Black iron armour worn by Drake Knights. Features the spoils of a dragon catch as an emblem of pride, as both a dragon hunter and partaker of communion. Again, Dragon Communion seems to be one of the darker elements of Lands Between Society. Yura warns us that while this provides great strength, eventually one will lose themselves to their hunger and indeed those who continue to partake in dragon communion beyond which is sensible become the magma worms, those dragons that are cursed to crawl the earth for their sins. In short, I do therefore think it's likely that Mesmer is once again associated with this heretical practice. Perhaps he was one of the first people to partake in such a heretical act of eating a dragon's heart. However, there's another aspect of his visual design that suggests to me it is likely that he has taken part in Dragon Communion. For if you zoom in on his open eye, you can see it's the serpent eye of one who has eaten dragon hearts. For those unaware, in the base game if you take Dragon Communion enough times, your character's eyes will actually transform to similar eyes like Mesmer's. Though again, time will tell if this visual design has anything actually to do with Dragon Communion. On the other side of the sword opposite to the flame is what appears to be a halo or a crown made of branches. Does this crown of twisted wood signify his lineage, that he is in fact the child of the goddess Marika, the ruler of the Erdtree society? Or does it mean something else? We have to wait and see I guess. The amount of things heterodox to the Erd Tree found in this DLC trailer makes me believe that the Land of Shadows, as the name would imply, is a place that is the opposite of the Erd Tree, a place where things that are spurned by the Erd Tree's grace do exist. We even see that the Omen have a presence here. The lion dragon boss that was showcased quite clearly has Omen horns sprouting from it, as well as the people underneath the dragon having limbs and feet that are reminiscent of Morgoths, for example. Just as an aside, fellow content creator Azale made an excellent observation 
that at a certain frame you can see this is actually made up of two omens standing on top of each other. This makes sense, as this is something I initially thought when I saw this boss, that it's like the Chinese dancing dragon. The lion or dragon head, however you want to look at it, is just like a costume that has been put over the top of two omens, a costume that has been puppeteered by the omen underneath. Note earlier on in the trailer when you see this boss, a hand seems to adjust the dragon's face as if it's a mask or a prop. Now returning to Mesmer, in short he is the ruler of the Shadowlands, all things dark that aren't allowed to be existing within the realm of the Erd Tree, and I believe that he rules this realm on behalf of Marika, that he is aligned with her, or at least was initially. There are a few reasons why. Firstly, for someone who seems to surround himself with so much heresy, he seems to share the disdain for the tarnish that people in Erdtree society do as well, referring to them as those bereft of light. Secondly, his relationship with Marika seems not to be combative, as we can judge from that tiny bit of dialogue. As you would expect from a lord of heresy who wants to destroy her world, instead he speaks to her cordially, and of course, as we've discussed, it seems as though there is a statue of Marika in his throne room, speaking volumes about his original allegiance. Aside from that, the throne that he sits upon that we talked about earlier, Miyazaki spoke of in the IGN interview, is exactly the same as the one found in Lanedale, suggesting that it was crafted by Marika and her society. Speaking of that quote, Miyazaki says that Mesmer stands on equal footing to the other demigods, and again just the language used by Miyazaki here makes me think that he was elevated to this position by Marika herself. He has a role to play here under her rule, to contain these things that are no longer meant to be in the world of grace, and to make sure whatever she did to create the Erd Tree and the Golden Order is not undone by anyone in the Land of Shadows. Indeed, if I'm correct about this relationship, it would be somewhat analogous to Gwyn and his relationship with his daughter Felionor, a long-hidden child who he tasked with overseeing something dangerous. She was the one who oversaw the seal at the Ringed City, an important task to seal away the Dark Soul. Again, returning to the flavour text from Bandai Namco's website, it says that these lands are purged by Mesmer's flame, reinforcing the idea that he is here to keep the denizens of these lands down. He is to rule over them, control them, likely on behalf of Marika. Now, I do want to caveat this with the idea that I think he was initially set up by Marika as the lord of these lands, but it's likely that he became more despotic and corrupted over time, which is unsurprising given how much he is surrounded by the heretical. After all, Mesmer the Impaler certainly makes one think of Vlad the Impaler, a ruler of Wallachia, whose cruel acts and methods of torture and killing became the original inspiration for the story of Dracula the Vampire. Like Vlad, has Mesmer become a despot, cruel and twisted beyond his original purpose? Again, we will just have to wait and see. I think it's time to reach a conclusion here and summarise what my overall thoughts are on what the story may well be. I think the Land of Shadows is a land that was created as it is now by Marika in her quest to create the Erd Tree. It was originally connected to the real universe, but because of her actions she somehow disconnected it from there, and now clearly plays an important role in the cosmological structure of this new world. However, while the world of grace with the Erdtree may be seen as a sort of heaven, this is clearly the hell, living in the shadow of the Erdtree rather than under its grace. Here are all the things deemed heretical, the omened, those who live in death, outer gods, and Mesmer, a child of Marika, was the chosen demigod who was meant to watch over this realm and make sure things stay as they are in order to preserve the realm of the Erd Tree. Marika gave him a throne and imbued him with lordship, and thus he became the Shadow Lord, a dark reflection of the Elden Lord in Laendel. I think that Mikla has come here to undo this and somehow cleanse these lands. We know that Mikla wants to make a future free from the meddling of the gods, a purer version of the Erdtree Order. Perhaps Mikla will completely undo this, or at least clean these lands from the shadow of the Erdtree. Beyond that, we cannot truly know why he wants to do this, nor how it plays into his ultimate goals or how it will affect a new ending, or even if Mikla's tricking us 
and everything we've learned about him is just a facade, and he is just as capricious as any of the other gods. Time will tell, but I think this is the general direction the story will take. So thanks guys, that is my take on the Shadow of the Erdtree trailer and its story implications. This was a lot of speculation of course, and I will have missed things. As I said, this isn't a frame by frame analysis, so please let me know your thoughts in the comments below, as well as any interesting connections that you have made. But in the meantime, remember to subscribe and like, as I will of course be covering the lore of Elden Ring when the DLC comes out, and I will be in the period between then and now, as there are a few subjects in the base game I want to cover. But until next time guys, I will see you in the Lands of Shadow. Take care and have a wonderful night.